From the standpoint of psychology, preppers are labeled as deviant because they don't fit the normal mold. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Hi, I'm Kyleen. And I'm Jonathan, and we are the Provident Preppers. We were recently contacted by Professor Ed Rawlinson from St. Thomas University in New Brunswick in Canada. Preppers fall into the realm of deviance because they represent a subculture that is relatively a small percentage of the population. Deviance in psychology is a violation of rules or conventions. Now, Jonathan, do you think of yourself as deviant? I guess I do from the standpoint that we are definitely a minority. But is it the wrong thing to do? No, it is the right thing to be doing, and we need more people to do it. Of course, all deviants think that they're doing the right thing, John. However, however, we really are. So, we had a great class with Professor Rollinson, and his students had some follow-up questions that we thought we would answer in a video because you just might be interested in the answer to some of these questions also. One way that I like to think about this and hopefully this can be applied to a different aspect of your lives. If you take a financial management class, you are going to be told the importance of an emergency fund. You're going to be told the importance of having good insurance. To us, the self-reliant to us, the self-reliant lifestyle provides that insurance. It provides that emergency fund. Even if nothing else, it provides you time. It gives you a space of time to get things figured out, to, to figure out your next step. And that, to me, is such an important aspect of this. Before we get into this, I should tell you that when we were in our original Zoom meeting with Professor Rollinson, that three of our children were able to attend. And a lot of these questions are directed towards some of the children. So we'll be breaking out and letting them answer some of these questions throughout this video also so that you can get their perspective on their deviant parents. <laughs> All right, we'll start with Emily. When were the children introduced to this kind of work and was it something they really had to be taught or was it something children were excited or interested to do? In our family, prepping has just been a way of life since we were married. We are very self-reliant and we are always interested in preparing for the future. So when it came time to package food storage into buckets, even though the kids, like I think one of the pictures, Benjamin is only 18 months old, maybe two years old, somewhere in there. And he's in there helping, marking the buckets. And we have buckets that are marked with Sharpie that don't look so attractive. They're, they have the, the kid um, what they look have? to them. They have the kid look to them. And it's amazing. It's so much fun to see those buckets, even today, to look at that. And just the fond memories are cool. Yeah. But when it comes to gardening, the children have always helped. And they've, we've tried really hard to teach them these skills. And sometimes I think that they think it's a little bit of a drudgery. But most of the yeah. time, it's just fun. It's just what we do as a family. And we work really hard to make it fun. And for me, side-by-side -side work with children is the most amazing experience because they learn and they grow as they go and that's the way you teach. Yeah. What are your plans for the future with regards to prepping? Absolutely continue prepping. Yeah, just keep doing what we've been doing. There's there's no need to change. It's a step-by-step -step process and we just keep it going. Now we will change a little bit depending on a constant risk evaluation because over time risks will change. They will. And so we will adapt to meet those upcoming new challenges. Do you have any big projects that you would like to implement into your family's prepping? We do have one project that's been ongoing for a little while but it's still got a long ways to go and that's our metal outbuilding. This is a place that we can meet as a family and gather, but it's also a place that we can invite others into if, if needed to extend our living space. Just like, so we live in a really small house, um, and so we have 11 children and 15, almost 16 grandchildren, and we just don't have room to meet, and so that is one of the purposes of building this large metal outbuilding. And yet when Sam recently contracted COVID-19, 
he had come here to quarantine and he stayed in the middle building so that he did not infect the family. And so it actually achieved a purpose that we had never really intended or, or foresaw that it would, um, yeah. it would serve. Um, how do you feel about others who look down on prepping? And that's okay. Yeah. People are going to have their opinions and we won't always agree, but I think we can all agree that working together is an important thing. And, and if we can be a greater part of that solution, I don't care what people think, really. I think a lot of people simply don't understand the importance of being self-reliant, of taking care of yourself. I think in some ways we live in a society where it's just expected that somebody else will take care of our needs, and that won't always be the case. Um, now, this is a question to the children. When you begin your own family and your own life outside of your parents' home, will you continue to live a prepping lifestyle? What kinds of things will you implement and what things will you do differently? What kinds of things would you implement and what would you do differently? Uh, well, first of all, this is assuming that I'm lucky enough to get a wife. <laughs> um, but I, I will continue prepping. Um, it's very important to me. I think that I was very lucky to be raised in a family that prepped, I feel very safe and I want my children and wife to feel the exact same way. So I will definitely prep. I think that the prepping lifestyle that you guys do is very, very good and I think it's very smart. So when I have a family, will I keep preparing? I think I will, just because it's always good to be prepared and just because that's the way I've been raised, I feel like Old habits are hard to break, and since it's a good one, I break it. What kinds of things would I implement, and what would I do differently? Um, I feel like I definitely implement like food and water storage, those are kind of necessary, and just everyday items that we use. I don't know what I'd do differently. I feel like all of what we do has a purpose, so I guess it would probably depend on where I live. There's no use in preparing for, like, a blizzard if I don't know <laughs> somewhere it snows. So I guess we'll just see about that one. Okay. When I begin my own family, will I continue the prepping lifestyle? I think I will. It'll be harder at first, especially with a new family, to get the money to do it. But I think I will definitely want to continue the lifestyle because the peace of mind that comes with it is fantastic. Um, what kinds of things would I implement and what would I do differently? Um, I think I just implement the same kinds of things, being able to live off the land, food storage, water storage, everything like that, just the basic things to get ready. Um, I don't think I'd really do anything differently. I just don't want to go overboard, but I don't think we have. So the prepping lifestyle has kind of become part of my life. Um, and I'm thinking it's safe to say that when I start my own family, that is going to be something that... I take into account is the preparations. Um, I don't think there's anything that I would necessarily do differently. Um, obviously when I start I'm probably not going to have um, a lot of the same resources that um, are available. I might be in a small apartment. Um, you know I might not have, you know I might be in a bigger city. I might have to adjust to that kind of a thing. But I don't think we can say for certain that um, you know, I wouldn't be able to adapt to that. That is something that I for sure would be looking into. How do you not let fear motivate your prepping lifestyle? Prepping can certainly be viewed as an anxiety-driven lifestyle. So what are you motivated by? And how do you not overthink these types of disasters that you are prepping for? I think that the reason a lot of people start into prepping is because of fear. They're afraid of things that are coming. Um, I think hopefully the transition is that we go from a, a, a place of fear to a place of love for our family, of community, of wanting to be part of the solution. And I think that when we, when we transform to that kind of perspective, it just becomes something that's enjoyable and that we know is a good thing to do. 
One of the things that prepping does for me is it helps to alleviate the fear because of the lifestyle that we live, which we should talk about. We are not actually extreme preppers. We're very much into self-reliance and making sure that we can produce some of our own food, that we have the supplies and the food stored that we may need. But when I go to make dinner at night, I don't have to worry that I'm going to have run out of an ingredient or that my family is going to be hungry because I have all kinds of different things to choose from. That really motivates me. There's not a fear element. There's a great confidence that comes with preparing. And it doesn't mean that I'll always have all the ingredients, but I'll always have the basic things that I can feed my family. And that's, that's great. A great motivator for me. All right, now Megan. Megan said, one thing that came to mind would be how this system would work for them because of the community that they live in. I would be interested to know how they would recommend folks with limited space and community relationships prep, i.e. people that live in small apartment buildings that do not have access to gardening, farm animals, and much storage place, for example. And that's a really great point because there are a lot of people that fit in that category. They don't have the homestead that we have, the acre and a half to, to grow things. But there's always something that you can do. And you start with that risk assessment and you start small and do what you can do. And that's what we have to tell people is do what you can do. And then just know that others or perhaps God will help do what you can't. Very good point. So one of the things that we should make sure that we point out is that we have lived in an apartment before and then we lived on a quarter acre when we got married. We lived on a little quarter acre lot and then a third acre lot and now we are living our dream. So it's been a progression and yet in each one of those places we were able to do whatever we could to be able to become a little bit more self-reliant. When you get creative, there's a lot of ways that you can do this. There's a video and I'll post a link to it that talks about creative places to store your food that you may not have thought about. Just don't give up. Do the best you can with the circumstances that are you, you are currently in. And one of the other points that I want to make is that uh, sometimes people think this is just an all-consuming thing that we do all the time. And, and in some respects it is. Because but, we're YouTubers, yes. But in, in most respects, this is a very small slice of our life that we have chosen to do this. And that's what we tell people. Just make this a small slice of your life. You don't, this doesn't have to take over your life. You can do what you need to do in a very short period of time. And we know that you have civic responsibilities and school responsibilities and all these other things that are important. If this is about balance, about putting this all in balance and just taking a little slice to do these kinds of things. And that's what we do. We, we do not take this to the extreme at all. JC asked, is everyone in the family involved in this? Do they all feel as strongly about this? Well, you know, we have a lot of children and many of them are grown and married and have families of their own now. And each one of them feels differently. Right. right? Fortunately, most of them or many of them still do prepping in one degree or another, some more than others. But um, as far as the children that are still at home, this is an important part of their life. And I guess we will see how that translates into their future. But this is something that we love doing together. Yeah. And, and it's been kind of fun to notice how prepping takes on a little bit of a different tweak with each one of them. We are really into the homesteading self-reliance piece of this. And so we produce a lot of our own food and we bottle things and we really are trying to live a self-sufficient lifestyle that way. Other ones are more into self-defense or they live a very, very busy life and they just store the food that they need and they're not producing it on their own because they really don't have time in their lifestyle. So everybody, it kind of looks different for everybody and that's right. okay. We, you, nobody has to do this like we do it. We can all be more self-reliant in our own way and benefit each other. Yeah. Okay, Mary, I would ask them more about what kinds of material supplies tools they keep at any given time and how much of it they would have. 
Also, I would ask them some of their ideas when it comes to prepping for such things as going for long amounts of time without electricity or access to fresh water. Okay, those are some really great points. And um, one of the things that when you look at all the risks that are out there, the long-term grid down risk is probably the one that is the most severe. And that could involve lack of water, lack of uh, sanitation, uh, the inability to travel or to get things, the inability to refrigerate. I mean, you look at what that would mean. Um, we're all very spoiled in this world, and uh, we just kind of assume that that will always be there, and it hopefully will be. I really hope that it is, but if it isn't, there's going to be some really serious problems. As far as um, what we have, we have just basic tools that we use to help accomplish our tasks, would you say? Yeah, so we do all kinds of challenges. Like we've gone for 30 days without using any electricity or natural gas to cook our food. For 30 days, it was a grid down cooking challenge. Including Thanksgiving dinner. Including Thanksgiving dinner. And so by, by doing that challenge, we understood exactly how much fuel our family would need to survive a long-term event. We were able to know which, which tools, which stoves, things like that, were best and what worked best for our family and we have accumulated those and our family is going to be different from your family. Very few people have 11, you know, children and 15, almost 16 grandkids. So we're going to be different than you. But we've also done a challenge where we didn't go to the grocery store for three months. Or out to eat. Or out to eat. That was, that was, that was really hard. That was tough. But that taught us exactly what we really need to have in our food storage to take care of our needs. One of the great takeaways that we learned from that was that we really don't need everything that we think we need. And our meals became much more simple. And life, it was hard work because we were more, if we didn't grow in the garden, we weren't going to get to eat it fresh, right? And so we were very focused on what we could grow and what we could produce. But it was just wonderful at showing us kind of a more simple, peaceful, peaceful lifestyle. I did miss going out to eat though. So when it comes to a list of something, no, we really don't have that because all of our prepping, it's not stashed away someplace. It's actually implemented into our regular life. Like we have a global sun oven and some people buy that and stick it away for an emergency, but we actually use it all throughout the summer to cook our food outside. And sometimes even fall, winter, and spring. I mean, we, yeah. we use it On a lot. the good days, yeah. One of the things that we are doing is creating an indoor garden. So we have this little room outside of our house. It's still inside of our house, but it, it doesn't have like central heating. It's where we keep our wood burning stove. And we have turned that into an indoor survival garden and have learned to produce an incredible amount of food in this little tiny space. It is so much fun for me, not so much for him. He gets to do all the projects and, and he works with the lighting and, and all that, but I get to grow the food. And I am amazed how much we could produce. One of the reasons why we did this was because the weather here where we live, it gets very, very cold and we cannot grow outside in the wintertime. We just cannot. And this enables us to grow regardless of what happens with the wind or the hail or the snow. We always can have fresh food growing. Um, the other thing that we've done is we're storing food, right? We store food long term that will help us survive when all of the craziness happens so that it buys us some time to get to a point where we could be able to grow or we could be able to figure out our next step. And, you know, none of us know all the answers and we don't have to. We just need to be willing to do what we can and help each other out and take it one step at a time. Emma says, they mentioned that they are community oriented. How does this work in a day-to-day -day capacity? Would the goal to be to create a self-reliant community? Oh, yes. Yes, wouldn't that be so nice? You know, you think about no poor among them. As we become more self-reliant, right, and we are able to share our excess and work together as a community, you eliminate that poverty because everyone is working together to be better and to do better and to help each other until we achieve something great. So that would be just the most incredible 
goal to be able to accomplish. Emma, how does this affect the children? It seems as though the children who were away at school had not told friends that they came from a family of preppers. Why do they choose to do that? As well as, how do they feel about their family having an online presence? I don't think it's much of a thing of peer pressure in a way, as it's just like, it's not something you just normally share. Not that it's a bad thing to share that. It's just something that doesn't really come up a lot. Do your friends know that your family are preppers? Uh, I think most of them do. I don't know, it's, it's not something we talk about a lot, like I said earlier. It's just not something that comes up a whole lot. I'm not necessarily reluctant to tell my friends, but it's not something that I just talk about on an everyday basis. But I guess I could talk about it more. I think the reason that I don't do that is just because it just never really comes up, never really becomes a talking point. I think the only time that I've really done that is when my roommate asked why I had water bottles under my bed. So something very basic and even that, you know, it just wasn't super in depth. How do you feel about your family having an online presence and being a YouTube star at the age of 14? So, uh, not gonna lie, I try not to think about that very much. <laughs> um, it is, it is kind of cool that we're, um, able to share this. Usually I don't like it when I see my face on YouTube recommendations. It's a little weird. Um, but for the most part, I really don't mind. <laughs> Unless one of my friends saw that they saw a video and then they saw that I was on it and they kind of were like Anyways, yeah, that's happened before a couple times and they're like, yeah I was like watching a video and your parents were on it and I saw you on there, too. And anyways, it It, it gets a little bit weird at that point, but Um, I honestly don't think about my online presence a whole lot because like I know I'm on YouTube and I know I have pictures of myself online but like, I don't know, I, I guess it's kind of cool, I, I don't know, I don't think about it a whole lot. I don't think I've actually watched a whole video that I'm in, <laughs> that's kind of weird. But like, I don't know, it's just part of life, I guess. As long as I'm helping people, I guess it's good. Um, my online presence. I feel like it's mostly my parents that have the online presence. That's just kind of being fun to be in the videos, but I don't know. Sometimes we get treats and stuff for being in the video, so worth it. <laughs> Three. Why would you do that? I didn't actually do that. Oh. I'm just cuddling with you. Oh. Ben, stop. Okay. Three, two, one. Hi, Hi we're, we're the, the Provident Peppers. Peppers. Okay, wait, gotta try that again. Three. Two, one. Hi, Hi we're, we're the Provident Preppers. Preppers. Week six. Benjamin. Ben, if you do this again, I might hurt oh. you. Ah. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> that one hurt. Um, how do, do we feel about our family having an online presence? I'm fine with it. We get to inform others, and a lot of what my parents' business, and I guess we fall under that too, um, our business. Um, what that, like a lot of what we do as family, our job is to help other people. Um, and that's our online presence is that we are helping the people who are trying to learn. Um, and our hope, I think, um, this is my hope for helping in the business. I don't, this is, I think this is what my parents want out of it, but is that those people who are taught by us are going to go teach other people, um, and ultimately, uh, we'll have more people prepared. Nicole says, I know it was stated that you have a goal not only to look out for your own survival, but to look out for your neighbors and to help your community as well. Is there a limit that has been established of how many people you would be able to help if things go south? I don't think so. I don't think there's a limit because when we all pull together and we all have talents and skills 
we all have the ability to help in different ways. I think we can get through everything. So I don't think there's a limit. I think we would all work together to what, I think we would all work together to get the job done. So, and when we talk about helping, I think there's a difference between someone coming here and living with us as part of our family um, and taking somebody homemade bread or soup or um, bartering some food with them or loaning them a tool. So there's, there's a big difference there in the depth of the help. But we do have a lot of children who live, some of them live in the city. And the plan is, if things get really bad, for them to try and make their way back here. So we are planning on having, you know, our family here. In addition to that, we have a few friends that we have um, agreed that if something happens, they can come here. And if something happens in our area, we will go to their home and we will be prepared to take care of each other. So do we have uh, any type of a limit? No, but you really have to understand we, we have a small home, right? There's, there's only so much capacity. So like our friend would need to bring a trailer or a tent or be willing to sleep on the couch. This is another one from Nicole. How would you suggest someone be a prepper and live off the land if they are living in an urban setting that does not permit them to have livestock or a garden, etc. Ooh, there's my indoor garden. Uh, we talked just a little bit about that, but I'm working on this beautiful indoor garden that is highly productive that you could do seriously in an, even in a small apartment or growing food on your um, patio or a balcony or anything like that that you have. But I think that does make a good point. Everybody's situation is a little different, and that is one of the things that we've tried to um, help people with that live in small apartments, especially, they just don't have the land, the space, you know, to do a lot of these things, but you can do what you can do. And you need to decide what those things are, whether it's acquiring a little bit of food, some water, um, whatever it is that you can do, then you do that. And you would be surprised how many opportunities there are. What about a community garden? What about making friends with someone who actually owns a home that's not too far away who is willing to let you help them garden a lot of elderly couples have gardened all of their lives just because of have living in the great depression and living through really hard times so they understand the value but now it's getting harder and harder they have the physical space to be able to do it what they don't have is the young young strong muscles and maybe you could provide some of that in exchange for both of you benefiting from what the land produces. Now, this is a really good question from Spencer. For prepping, what is too much prepping or too little prepping? Oh, the question of the day. Always trying to find that balance, When right? is enough enough? I, th I think you have to decide that for yourself. What, you know, what can you do? Uh, what is too little? Probably doing nothing is too little. What is too much? Um, you know, you'd, you'd have to decide that, but I think as you take first steps and next steps, you kind of just know what your next step needs to be, what you need to do, what you don't need to do. There are things that other preppers do that we don't because we yeah. don't feel like that's appropriate or that that's the right thing to do. Um, but that's kind of an individual thing that you need to find your balance on. For me, the little golden question is whether or not I'm able to enjoy life today. Because life is supposed to be good. It's supposed to be challenging, yes, but we're supposed to be able to enjoy it. If my prepping for some future potential event makes it so that I am unable to enjoy my life today, then something's off balance. If I am not sacrificing something today to prepare for some future event, then I am not doing enough. And like Jonathan said, it, it really depends on the individual and the individual circumstance. When is enough enough for us? We haven't reached that point where enough is enough yet, but we may have reached it in a category. Like we may have enough propane fuel or we may have enough wood stored. But um, as far as the lifestyle goes, um, it, we just really enjoy what we're doing and living it every day. So, 
All right, Maya, what sorts of things are talked about in your book? This is our book, The Provident Prepper. And in it, we go through pretty much everything that you need to know for basic emergency preparedness. If you go through this book, there's an action plan with each chapter. And if you complete that action plan, um, seriously, you are well on your way to becoming prepared for just about anything that could happen. Right. And those action plans aren't a checklist for you to check off. It's a way to get your mind in gear to wrap your head around. It gives you some ideas on there, some thoughts, um, but then you design that to meet your needs. The reason we wrote that book was to break things down. We had so many people say, I don't even know where to start. They don't, they don't prepare for anything or become self-reliant because it's so overwhelming until you break it down. It's like eating the proverbial elephant. You have to break it down into small pieces. When you break it down in small pieces, you can go, oh, okay, I can do this. Okay, I can do this. Okay, I can do this. And that was the purpose of the book, was to break it down into bite-sized pieces so that people could just take a step at a time and actually make progress. I think the best compliment that I have ever received came from a woman. We were teaching a class at an expo, and she stood up and back, and she said, you know, I picked this up at Walmart, and I just did it on an impulse. It was there, and I bought it. And she said, this is the first time I ever felt that I could really do this. And that's exactly what we were wanting. We want people, everyone, to be able to just be a little bit more self-reliant, a little bit more prepared. So that was really cool for us. Yeah. Thanks, Mia. Um, Joseph, they seem to be prepared, especially for natural disasters. But what happens if there's an unnatural event, such as a nuclear attack or um, radiation poisons or destroy the natural goods, garden, livestock? Are you prepared or do you have plans for such events? Okay. Yeah, and, we, and as we mentioned, we do try and prepare for natural disasters, but we also see some really huge things that could happen. Hopefully you don't, but there is the possibility of things like an EMP, of, of nuclear war. Um, and yes, we as we've done our risk analysis, we're looking at all these kinds of things and taking reasonable steps to prepare for them. Yeah, absolutely. It's there. There's a lot to be concerned about, right? A lot of different things that could happen, um, including things like a financial collapse or um, nuclear war. All or another of, pandemic. That's another pandemic. Worse. Um, I mean, these are all things that scientists are telling us are going to happen. But the basics are all the same, right? The basics. You've got to have food stored. You've got to have water stored. You've got to have this family plan. You've got to be able to live without electricity, whether it's man-made or naturally made that causes you not to have electricity. You need to be prepared to live without it. So all those basics translate into covering a whole variety of different potential scenarios. Um, Alyssa, one question that came to mind was when we were talking about not hiding anything and being open from their with their kids and moreover their kids being a part of prepping. I am wondering if since they've been involved at a very young age and knew how they would respond if something catastrophic were to happen, if the stages of prepping gave them fear and anxiety for the future and what could happen. And I think we'll let the kids answer that for the most part, but I think we've tried in all of this to be very open and upfront, and I think that empowers the kids. Instead of creating fear and anxiety, it's like, yeah, that could happen, but we know what we'll do. We've got a plan, and it's so empowering for them to understand what's going on in the world and some of the challenges that could happen, but know that there's a path out and that, that we're going to be all right. We'll work together and we'll be okay. And it's important to recognize the age appropriateness of the things that you are sharing with the children, right? Um, you're not going to tell a four-year-old the same things that you're going to share with a 14-year-old. They, they process things just so differently that, that that would be inappropriate. But we did have an event. It was really interesting because we don't have regular television here. We have television sets, right? And we, 
we have some internet and things that we'll watch movies, but for the most part, we don't have any regular stations that come in on a regular basis. But my mother-in-law does, and the kids had gone over to her house one night, and she had the news on, and they saw all these scary events. I'm trying to remember what it was. There was like massive fires, and anyway, but they were younger, and they came home, and they were, they expressed this, right? We have this real open dialogue about it, and they expressed their fear. And I said, well, okay, so what if that happens here? What would we do? And one of them said, oh, we'd be fine because we have our food storage. Now, what does a wildfire have to do with us having our food storage? You know, the correlation really isn't there, but it created a lot of security because they're concrete thinkers, right? See it, smell it, touch it, taste it, feel it. Um, so for that child, it made them feel very secure. The older children process it differently and said, okay, well, we have our evacuation plan. We know where we'd go. We know what we'd do, right? And so for them, it really does create security. But now we'll let them tell you what they think about it. So I think that when you've kind of grown up, knowing that your family is preppers and they've taken action on these things, and I, I think it was actually, it, I don't know, it was very reassuring to know that as I was growing up from, from my little, little years. So uh, I don't think it was actually that scary as long as I knew that, you know, we were going to be okay. And knowing about that, I don't know, I'm not very fearful about the future right now, knowing that. You know, we've prepared for this and we're probably going to be okay. I'm driving anxiety and fear toward the future because of prepping. I don't think so. Like, I mean, obviously, it's kind of alarming to know that bad things are going to happen because, but we all know they're going to happen and we all know that they can happen at any time. And it's kind of comforting knowing that while we may not be 100% prepared, we tried and we'll at least have the basics. It's kind of comforting to know that I'm not just going to be left out there relying on someone else for help. Um, not really. I think especially when I was younger, I might have a little bit, just because we were talking about what could happen. But now that I'm older, not now that <laughs> now that I'm a little older, I have seen that there is a lot of wisdom in preparing, and I know that it'll give me peace of mind, and it already has given me peace of mind, and so not really any fear and anxiety, just. Peace of mind and happiness and joy, all sorts of good things. So I don't know if it's just the style that we, we've we used or if it's just prepping in general. I have never had, well, I mean, you're always going to have a little bit of anxiety for the future. Um, you know, just like any other, you know, going into any other stage of life, um, you know, moving out. Um you know, going to college, getting jobs and stuff, you're always going to have a little bit of anxiety for the future. Um, I have never really found or felt a lot of anxiety um, towards current world events um, because I know that if things were to happen, um, I know that we've prepared for this. I know that we've done everything that we possibly could to get ready for it. Um, and ultimately, I think whatever happens is going to be the will of God. So I think um, even as a teenager, never really had a whole lot of anxiety for the future because I know that we were going to be prepared. This has been a really great experience for us. We've loved interacting with you. Even though it's not in person, we've loved interacting. We've loved thinking about your questions. Um, and we've loved just being able to share what we believe and what we find important and valuable. We recognize that not everybody sees this the way we do. Um, we recognize that some of you may be interested, some of you may have no interest at all. But we'll just ask the question of the day, I guess. Um, what can you do to become just a little bit more self-reliant today than you were yesterday? We believe that self-reliance provides great peace. It provides great help to communities. And it provides the stability 
that helps us go on and have a joyful life. Thanks for being part of the solution.